when a customer journey is happening even before engaging us, unless you happen to get lucky and you're at the front end, which would be the ideal spot to be in, because then you can help influence and craft that they're going to do an RFI and RFP. You help influence that, which is really where you want to be. But that research that has to be done prior to going in and any way that you can with the access to information is just critical in today's world. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez, Jr., You're now listening to Selling with Social. Kim Green Kerr, my friend, my longtime friend. I am so excited that you are joining me here on Selling with Social. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Mario. My pleasure. And I also am very, very, very excited. And I know you've announced this already, and I know it's already been announced, but for those people that are listening in to the podcast right now, not only have I known Kim for, I guess it's been almost 20 years, your whole career at Sprint when we were there together, but right. your name popped up again, and I was so excited to see this, that you ended up in the 2018 Top Global 100 Sales Leaders as identified by the Modern Sale Magazine. Congratulations on that accomplishment. Thank you very much. I was honored and and humbled at the same time. Well, you know, I I gotta tell you, I was actually speaking at Dreamforce in 2017 and someone walked up to me and they said, Mario, congratulations. And I said, on what? And they said, look in the magazine, you're you're in the magazine. And I opened up the Mm -hmm. magazine and they're like top 10 sales influencers of 2018. And I was like, what the, (laughs) how did this happen? (laughs) No surprise though, Mario, you've got the passion for it. You've been evangelizing this for a very long time. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. And it's, it's truly an honor. Like when you work so hard for something such as yourself, and I've seen your career, I've seen you advance. You've been with Sprint, I think, 22 years. And I'll, I'll let you tell the audience a little bit about what you do and who you are. But when you see something like your name get into the magazine, I was like, man, I looked through this and I was like, I got to get Kim on my show. So Kim, do me a favor. Just give the audience a little bit of background about who the great Kim Greenker is. (laughs) You're so funny. Yeah, so I have been with Sprint, and actually it was originally Nextel, and it's been about 22 years. And the truth is you don't start off saying that you're going to be at a company for 22 years, but I've held a variety of positions over the years. And in fact, in the last 12 years, I've had about nine different bosses. So certainly my ability to adapt is there. And at the the other part of this is I've had many different jobs. So I've done a consumer job where I was a regional president. I've ran enterprise government, SMB sales. I did a training rotational assignment. So I've done a lot of different things and a lot of different roles, which really makes it interesting. And it's one of the reasons why I have selected to still have my career and stay with Sprint. And of course, the good news is the company has still wanted me here. But it's also just a very dynamic environment, changing industry, which makes it interesting. And then we have such a great culture at Sprint. So my job that I have today is I run all of business sales. So enterprise, which is, you know, your Fortune 1000 larger companies, government sales, so that's federal. And then, of course, you could imagine the public sector ones, which are, you know, health, K through 12, higher ed, state and local, and then, of course, small and medium business. So the way we define small and medium business is any company from one employee up to 999. I have field sales and I have different channels that serve, support, and sell depending upon the segment. And it's been a wild, crazy ride, but I love it. And um, hopefully I'll be here another five years as we're in the turnaround at Sprint. And it's just an interesting time right now in the industry in general. So yeah, I've really enjoyed my career. And if I'm not mistaken, Kim, you also had a stint inside of the sales strategy, sales enablement operations side of the house as well, correct? I did. I sure did. And that was really an interesting role because 
you know, when you're in sales, Mario, as you know, and you're in the field, you have a tendency to throw all that operational tools and implementation, all that over the fence. And so when I did that role, the great news is I could bring a field perspective when I came into the headquarters. Yeah. And so you still had, I was still responsible for sales at the same time, but I had the, all that operational improvements and working cross-functional within any company, which is really hard to do because you don't own it end to end. You have IT over here, you have operations over here, you've got network over here and, you know, systems and tools. And so it was a great experience to also be in that role for almost two years as well, to see the improvements and the investments that we've made. And then that learning all of that, and then how do you improve? And then what is that impact? to the field on productivity. Yeah, I think when anybody who has been in the field and goes into the sales strategy side of the house, you bring a totally different ideology, if you would, because you understand you've lived, breathed and died and you've been in the trenches, you know, you've been a soldier and you've also been a a colonel, right? So it's a different mindset that you bring into that role. and, And that's why it's been really great to actually watch your career, Kim, particularly because you're a woman. And it's not oftentimes that you see women in sales at the top in leadership. In fact, a recent stat I just heard was, which is really unfortunate, that about 33% of all salespeople are actually women, but 12% of all sales leaders are women. And that is a very unfortunate circumstance, but it's changing and it's in the right trajectory in terms of going up. And it's very near and dear to my heart, particularly because as you know, and as my listeners know, when I started Vingresso as an example, I had a requirement on my strategy board. It said I needed to have at least 50% minority owned. And minority in my book is anybody of a different ethnic background or woman, right? Or women, not woman, women. (laughs) And we accomplished that. We, We were able to do that successfully. And so I think for the listeners, as they listen in, we're definitely going to touch on some interesting topics, but one of them I want to touch on, if it's okay with you, Kim, is really about how to make your way to the top and how to sustain that. Because I think you're a model example for those listeners that are out there, whether you're Hispanic, you're black, or you're a woman, uh, or if you're any type of minority status, you're an example of those that can make it to the top. Well, so what I would say is, and you know, it's interesting because this seems to be a hot topic. I was at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona and met with about 18 powerful women in high positions. And the discussion is around the gender gap. And then how do you, you know, first of all, you know, females, but then just diversity in general. And one of the things I would say, and, you know, that I've, it's become very apparent is, you know, first, you've got to work hard. You've got to demonstrate that you can do the job. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Nobody, you know, you might know someone that helps you advance your career, but if they're going to invest in you or support you, you've got to make sure that you've got the goods and that you can deliver the results. And that's one thing I've always done throughout my career is I was dependable, took initiative, a hard worker, a lot of those intangible qualities that you have to possess, but also to find a way to get the job done and very creatively and never give up. And it's not like you're faced with with that obstacles. I mean, think about sales, Mario, you and I both know this. You have good months and bad months and it ebbs and flows and then deals in your funnel that you think you're going to close and then they don't for whatever reason. A political thing could have happened. I mean, there's just a myriad of headwinds and that's yeah. why everybody's not in sales because it's hard yeah. and there's a lot of rejection. And what most people from the outside see is all the glory and the recognition. What they don't see is the amount of work and what it takes. And that's just sales. But in any job that you have, one key aspect that I would say is and you learn it over time. And I counsel, I mentor women and, you know, we, and we have discussions because I'm really a big supporter of mentoring and not just women, by the way, men, women, both. But what I do say is don't be in your own world and keep your head down and say, because I'm doing a great job, everybody's going to notice. And mm. so that doesn't mean that go out and, you know, tell everybody the world about what you're doing, but you do want to make sure that people understand the value that you bring. So volunteering for other kinds of cross-functional initiatives and getting that kind of visibility and making sure that you're talking to your boss or others in an organization and volunteering helps you and helps advance your career. The other thing is, yes, we talk a lot about mentoring and that is important and a mentee and a mentor, there's no doubt that that helps you and you learn a lot. But the biggest component of that is as you go throughout your career is a sponsor. And that sponsor does not 
it doesn't have to be official, but you need someone. And the difference between a mentor and a sponsor is a mentor is giving you feedback and they're coaching and developing you. A sponsor is someone that when you're not there and when people say, who do you know that could do this particular job that I have available, that sponsor is advocating on your behalf. And that is what you have to have. And you get those sponsors throughout your career. And I've had many that advocate when I'm not there that help advance because you get them by delivering the results, whether it's your immediate, whether you help somebody else out in an or, uh, another organization, you served on a quad team, quality action team, whatever the case may be. But that's how you start to get that kind of exposure. And then you have people that are talking on your behalf because they start to see what you bring to the table, the value, the execution component, the operational sales, whatever it is. And that's how you advance. And, and if you're asking that, you know, me, one, you always have to deliver the results. There's no doubt. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. And if you don't do it, then you figure out a way what went wrong. That you're not excuse driven, you're results driven. So you figure out what that is. And then the other component of that is you're dependable, you take initiative, you're a team player, all of those things. And then having that sponsor or those sponsors throughout my career has helped me to get where I am. And yep. it's email and mail. You need both. Yeah. I love what you just said. And, you know, something that I definitely knew about, but don't really often talk about is getting that sponsor, right? To help you. And as you said, the individual behind closed doors, when you're not there, whose name are they bringing up, right? Now, I believe, you know, and actually I forgot, <laughs> hold on, let me, I forgot to ask you something, Kim. And I forgot to bring- what? Yeah, my audience is always expecting me to ask this question right at the beginning. And we're writing some ju juicy stuff here. So let me pause and come back to this sponsor. But Kim, I forgot to ask you my million dollar question. And that was, tell us something nobody would know about you by looking at your social profiles. Okay. Something you would not know about me by looking at the profile. All right. How about three quick things. One, I have a daughter and I'm married and my daughter's 11. And of course they grow up so fast. It's, she's 11 going on 16. So I have to try to keep her young and no, she does not have a cell phone. Although she calls me the cell phone lady and thinks it's very unfair. But I said in due time Two, I love animals. We have three dogs, two cats and did have a fish that recently passed away. So it's like a menagerie at my house. And the third thing is I was on TV at the age of five. Yes. Bozo the clown though. My brother and I were on that show, if anybody remembers that. Wait, wait, Bozo the Clown? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, I, I did not know that. I got to find that clip. I've it, never been able to find it. I would love to see it. It's hilarious. I think about that. It's funny. That is a good one. All right. Well, we haven't had a TV star yet, so we'll, we'll take that one. Well, there you uh, go. Well, that clearly uh, uh, helps me to understand then how you ended up as a bachelor's in journalism with a minor in PR and now in sales. <laughs> it all comes together now. That's fantastic. And I took that pause there for a second because I think it's helpful for people just to understand, you know, who you are and what you're, sure. what you're about. But going back to this, this discussion about finding a sponsor, getting a sponsor, generally speaking, my experience is the sponsors come by way of, to your point, being involved in an organization, volunteering to do things that are outside of your, your organization, that are you know, community related, that are tough task force that the, the organization has put together, and they see the results, and usually you'll get the sponsors. Or, and this is the question part, or are you actively going out? Should I, as, a, as an individual within an organization, actively going out and finding someone to be my sponsor. Will you sponsor me? Will you sponsor me? Will you sponsor me? Like, how does this come about? Yeah. To go out and ask someone to be your sponsor. Would you sponsor me? <laughs> That's not the way it works. Probably and not. It, <laughs> yeah. And think about it just in general, when you've seen people that you think are very sharp or just have observation a peer, you know, maybe somebody that you worked for, somebody that you saw, you know, in another organization, it's because you see them doing the work and you're impressed with that and you see them delivering. It's more of an evolution and it becomes not official, but when you're serving on those committees or the volunteering or doing an extra initiative, even within your own team, you become the team leader, as an example, when let's say the sales manager's out, if you're an individual contributor, right? That kind of uh, volunteering or that kind of visibility or that kind of effort, then it starts to evolve naturally. 
Now, you could ask if you're a salesperson, as an example, because I know that's really the audience here is, you know, our sales brethren out there. Yeah. You could ask your immediate manager if that is your desire to move up as you, you know, become like a specialized topic or a subject matter expert on something that's relevant for the entire team, or maybe on an industry, what's happening in an IoT, whatever that is. If you become that person that says, hey, you know, boss, when you're out, I'd love to run the team meeting for you. And then you start to get that kind of exposure. Then you could ask your immediate supervisor, hey, I would like to get ex- more exposure to your boss. And that could be this special initiative, the subject matter expert, and then that boss, that's that's kind of an official sponsoring, if you will, to help you get to that, that next level. But then as you move up in the organization, it becomes not as official as much as it is how you deliver the relationships that you build. And then the other thing that you'll find, Mario, and you know this, is that when somebody's going to sponsor you, you kind of know that they are in, in a sense because of the relationship that you start to have with them yeah. and the mentoring, the things that they tell you and the conversations that you have. Yeah. So it's not so much official. You are my official sponsor, but you start to know that. You know that people are advocating on your behalf. And in fact, throughout my career, I've actually had a, you know maybe somebody that I knew that thought highly of me, but then it was more solidified because they came and said, hey, I put your name in for this particular role, which I had yeah. no idea. That, exactly. that is where you want to get to. But it, exactly. but it evolved over time. But it goes back to you have to deliver the goods. You have to do what you say you're going to do. You have to be dependable. You have to take the initiative. All the things that everybody knows, but you've got to do it. You've got to execute on it. Yeah. And one other thing that I think I have done as well, um, and I've seen as I've mentored others, I've recommended this to them is, you know, oftentimes, especially in sales, we love to complain. <laughs> we love to say it's broken. This is not working. This sucks, right? I mean, I'm sure you've heard that a billion times, right? Well, I do it myself, Mario. Come on. I mean, everybody <laughs> likes to have an outlet, but then you wake up the next day, put your big girl or boy pants on and you go at it again. Exactly. That's the difference. Right. Yeah. But you know, one of the things though, that can immediately start putting you into those leadership categories, as well as finding that sponsor is when you find a problem and if it's not easily fixable, volunteer to help lead a small task force to figure out how to make it better. Yes. Right. That's a great point. And I think that's as salespeople and sales leaders that are coming, you know, whatever your role is, or if you're marketing, doesn't matter, whatever your role is, when you see a problem and it frustrates you that much that you think it's that dumb and that broken and that should be better, then why not come together and say, hey, boss, boss's boss, boss's boss's boss, whoever it is that you're complaining to, and say, look, this sucks. This doesn't work right. But you know, I would be open if you want me to. I'd be open to volunteer to assemble a small task force of a couple folks and whoever you think is necessary, or I've got a couple folks in mind that could really come up with some better solutions on how to make this better. What do you think? Can I, can I take that on boss? As long as you're delivering on your number, your, your role, along with this new task you signed up for, that's how you start also being found as well. There's no doubt that is, by the way, that applies to any problem that you encounter or any role that you have, but that is absolutely a hundred percent spot on. And in fact, as salespeople, we do complain. You know, there's headwinds and there's external headwinds, which you have no control over. There's internal ones, you know, the system, the tools. I don't have this. I don't have this product. I mean, you go on and on and on. And we always want more. That's just what we are. That's natural salespeople. But you're, the key point that you hit on, Mario, is, hey, I can identify, we can all identify problems, the difference and what really differentiates an individual and that's impressive to me is the ones that come forward and either A, they thought it through and say, look, I've got some possible solutions. Now, whether or not they're viable is a whole nother thing. Yeah. But the other component is they have volunteered to help problem solve. I'll be a part of that task force. And that is so important. And then, by the way, you will also find that the leadership team is more open when you come forward with, hey, here's the problem, but here's possible solutions, or I'll volunteer to go help and pull together a team, cross-functional team to try to solve it and figure out what we can come up with. Yeah, You'll get much more support in that realm. And so that's a great point that you bring up. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I love that. That's a great point. One thing I want to touch on here on this podcast is... And one of the things I love about your background is you've had the retail side of the experience. You've also had a plethora of experience in the business to business side of things. And we're not talking about just a sprint being wireless only. We're talking about, you know, the wireline assets that you've got, the traditional telecom side, plus your wireless. We're talking about large, you know, like when I was there at Sprint, we were doing large $45 million, you know, total contract value type deals, right? Like, so there's some, some really large opportunities that you guys have created um, in the enterprise segment. But I do believe 
that something has changed. And, and I would love your perspective coming from, you know, a global uh, a Fortune 100 organization. And that is the world of buying and selling. I have been advocating this, as you know, for the last couple of years, that it's changed. I think a lot of leaders are recognized that it's changed, but a lot of leaders and reps are continuing to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But I want you, you know, challenge me, tell me I'm crazy. Do, do you think the world of buying and selling has a changed? And if so, how? And if not, tell me how you don't think it is. There's no question when, Mario, when we started off carrying a bag and where we are today, it has changed and you have to adapt with that dynamic. And the biggest impact was the fact to access the information. Yeah. And so what you can't do is go in and do that traditional, well, tell me about your business and tell me about your pain points and all the stuff that, that is probably right there at your fingertips. And that is the biggest change. And you, you have to adapt. And the amount of information that is available to you prior to going into a meeting, and especially the larger enterprise, they expect it. And if you were to walk in and ask such basic rookie questions, you're not going to get very far and you're not demonstrating the value. And the rule of thumb is, you know, when you leave a meeting, maybe, and especially as you're ideating with a, with a client, you know, do they think of you and said, wow, I would have possibly even paid for that meeting because of the value that you brought to them and the dialogue and exchange of ideas that you had. And the way you do that is the preparation component, especially on the enterprise side. So you have to go and do the research. And there's so much available today. And I know we'll get into this, Mario, but you and I both know there's blogs that a CEO does. There's just all this information that you could look at and pick up, like, what are they talking about? And then you can tie that back in and you're planning when you go in to meet with the customer. And I, I, you probably know the stat, but I think it's you know 57% of the buying process, I believe that's the stat, has already been done prior to you even coming in the door. So a lot of that with a customer journey is happening even before engaging us, unless you happen to get lucky and you're at the front end, which would be the ideal spot to be in, because then you can help influence and craft if they're going to do an RFI and RFP, you help influence that, which is really where you want to be. But that research that has to be done prior to going in and any way that you can with the access to information is just critical in today's world. Yeah, I agree with you. And the stat that you quoted, 57%, it ranges anywhere between the 57% to 80% of that research has been completed prior to a right. buyer picking yeah. up the phone and calling you. So, I mean, whether you call it 80% or you call it 50%, the fact of the matter is, is they're out there researching. In fact, I'm actually delivering a, a keynote next week at a sales leadership conference. There's about 800 sales leaders that will be in the room. And I picked up some new research and this is hot off the press as this came from CEB, a Gartner company. And it was interesting that they identified, they interviewed and polled uh, 750 B2B buyers. And get this, uh, Kim, in B2B buying today, the portion of time that is spent on buying activities, all right? So this is from CEB, a Gartner company. And this is the portion of time spent on key buying activities. The research showed that the buyers are spending 27% doing independent research online. Then 22% of the pie is spent meeting with the internal buying group. And then that buying group, those individuals are spending 18% of their time is spent researching independently offline. So calling up their friends, calling up their fellow peers in, the organ in different organizations, getting information on who did you use, what did you use, what were your experiences like. So if you look at the numbers here, we're talking about 27% researching independently online, 22% of the time they're spent with the buying group, and then you've got another 18% that is spent uh, researching independently. That's 67% of the time that buyers are spending time on these different key buying activities. We're not, we haven't even got to meeting with potential suppliers yet, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what's, what's even more interesting is that CEB identified that the buyers identified that only 17% of the buying time is spent on meeting with potential suppliers. Now, on average, I think most organizations probably have at least two other competitors, right? So let's just say there's three competitors. So if they're sure. spending 17% of their time meeting with potential suppliers, that means you're really only getting about less than 6% of the time of the whole buying process, right? 
this whole thing in related to access to information available online, a lot of sales leaders have put their head in the sand and they've stuck to traditional methodologies to be able to create outreach. Now, I'm not the advocate and you know I'm not. I never advocate that the cold call is dead and you shouldn't send any more emails for God's sakes. I mean, we still have phones. You and I talk on the <laughs> phone, right? We, <laughs> but there are other ways to bring buyers and sellers together. And I think that's just been an interesting challenge in the industry. And what I want to know from you, Kim, is, is you know, your advice to leaders. Clearly, you guys are an online company. Clearly, you have an online channel. You also have a retail segment. But in the business world, you're having your reps engage with their particular um, buyers in market. And I think you also have an inside uh, sales program, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. Is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So what's your best advice for this world of buying and selling? It's changed. Buyer research is being done. Now what? What do I do as a leader? Well, there's things that we're doing. And obviously, and I'm sure this will resonate with other leaders, but we, our aspirational goal is to be a trusted advisor. And, you know, we can solve business problems. We work with them. They, they see us as a trusted partner. Now, are we at that status in its entirety? There's no way. It is an absolute journey that we're on to get there. But one of the things we are doing, and we're taking it up another notch, is we've rolled out a what we're calling sprint way of selling. Mm -hmm. And it's we are stressing the need to understand the customer needs before you start, you know, showing up and saying, hey, look at this solution or this solution. And you really don't even know what it is that they need. And sometimes a customer doesn't even know what it is they need. And so this whole sprint way of selling is a sales methodology that really hones in on, you know, the buying center and the opportunities and and we do what are called pit stops on Fridays. And it's a national initiative that we do pit stops across our 1,200 sales leaders. And not everyone has a pit stop on a Friday. Obviously, you don't have that much time. But we do it. And it's a cadence. And we've rolled this out. We're about a year into it. Because we understand and we know that we need to train our people on how to do that. Saying it is one thing. But then showing them the path to get there. And how do you do it? And how do you go about it? is a huge component. So there's as part of that whole sales methodology and coaching and opportunity management and the buying center and looking at all aspects of that is the research component. And where do you go do the research? And then how do you find out the information? And the other piece of this, and this is another opportunity for us, Mario, clearly, is the whole social selling component. And what avenues do you leverage, whether it is literally LinkedIn, Facebook, I mean, you, you know, the gamut, and yeah. then training on that with the social selling component to take it to the next level. And that is our next area of opportunity is we first needed to get this baseline of the sprint way of selling and the methodology and opportunity management and what we're doing there. We're all saying the same thing. And then the next phase that we will evolve to is the whole social selling component and being an influencer and, and helping our reps be able to blog and to get out relevant content to their particular customers. And so that is a journey that we're on. I think every sales organization is always on a journey and they're evolving, but we are evolving as an organization. And it's exciting. I, in fact, I had a, my first call today was a pit stop with an analyst company that we are trying to figure out and really have a good way to add value to how they're running their business. And so that's the journey that we're on. But And that's the advice that, you know, I give to, you know, my peers out there in terms of, you know, they're evolving as well. But the first thing is just, you know, your sales methodology and making sure that there's a regular cadence around that. And then our next journey is obviously going to be into that social selling realm. Well, that's fantastic. And um, Kim, I'm going to do a funny here, but um, I think I may know a company that can help you on that evolution for, uh, for social and digital. I think, I think I know somebody. First name starts, it's like Mario or something. Yeah, yeah something like so. that. I mean, we just we may know somebody that can help to yeah. transform the organization there. Uh, that's my shameless plug for all my listeners here, right? I'm talking to my friend and uh, my podcast guest. <laughs> Yes. And you know, you and I've talked about this and I, I will be completely honest. I mean, if we had tried to do this two years ago, we were not ready. Yeah. If you don't have a core foundation of your methodology and what it means to move a particular prospect and an opportunity throughout a funnel, and we're all speaking the same language and understanding how to do that and training our folks. I mean, that's a big thing that we do at Sprint is we invest in our people. It was one of my number one priorities two years ago when it remains that is how do you invest in your people and develop their skills? And people want that. How do I develop professionally and personally? And that's part of it. Yeah, and well, then 
eventually the social selling component will come. It's a great add-on to this and it's a necessity. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head because even when we train organizations and we're helping them develop different types of messaging, right? When you connect with somebody or when you you reach out to someone through a digital channel, whether it's through a video message that you might send or whether it's through a text or whether it's through a LinkedIn message. Just a couple days ago, I was working on one of our newest clients and I was out training in Austin. And I said, you know, how many of you get responses to your emails? Very few of them raised their hands. Uh, Why do you think that is? Well, and so we looked at some of the examples and we're like, mm. so basically you are given crap in and you're expecting to get, not get crap out, right? And the same exact thing is true. If you're taking that same exact message and having diary of the mouth in terms of pitching online and or through wow. digital format, you're going to get the same exact results, whether it's email or whether it's through digital. So you hit the nail on the head, develop that sales methodology, have everybody sing in the right tune, have them understand the, the right types of messaging that resonates with their customers. Then once you've got that nailed down, now you can move on into taking that and figuring out how to actually leverage it through a digital format, whether it's through social, whether it's through text or whether it's through video, right? Totally agree. And I love the way you described really your journey that you're on, right? In the sprint business and how to differentiate yourself. And part of it is, is the whole pit stop concept and helping develop them with the right methodology. One of the other things that is popping up though, not popping up, I, I, that's actually the wrong word. One of the things that's happened <laughs> in our world is the growing millennial sales force. And oftentimes what we hear is that this particular segment of workers, which are now represents, I think it just hit 53 million people in terms of the workforce versus the Gen Xers of 50, sorry, baby boomers, which of 52 million. It, so it happens to now be the largest part of our workforce. One of the challenges that we see is that this generation constantly is wanting to move up and around, right? They usually don't sit in one spot for more than two years. And there's many other generalizations that have been made on millennials. I'm not going to sit here and make generalizations, but I do want to understand what should sales leaders do and or what do they need to be thinking about as they manage this growing millennial sales force? And I know that you have a lot of experience with this, particularly when it comes to your retail side, as well as your small business segment and your the lower end enterprise segment where you're bringing fresh new blood in to the organization. So talk to a little bit about that and give some advice there. What we are finding is, and you know, there's an expectation, these millennials, they grew up with technology. And the biggest thing is they want to be able to do their job when they're ready to do it with the right tools. And that is, you hear that feedback consistently about having the right tools to, elect, to enable them. And so that is key. So technology is a key component to what they care about when they're coming into an organization. There's no doubt. And I think it's something for a, you know, when they're considering the role, they look at the technology and the enablement of the systems and tools and have the ability to do their job. And even when we look at satisfaction surveys, you know, everybody does the SPS scores, if you will, because you care about the promoter scores internally about what your employees are saying. And that's how you craft action plans as you get that feedback. And we will see that that comes up about the ability and enabling them to do their jobs with the right technology. And of course, coming in, the great thing about being at a technology company, Mario, as you know, is that we do have that technology. We have the tablets and the wireless devices and, you know, the different things that allow them to be with the latest and greatest. And that's always a, you know, a differentiator is when they're coming to work at Sprint. But then once they get here, they still want the other tools to enable them to be able to do their job. Yeah. So, so leaders really need to be thinking about how to leverage technology, which also means that leaders need to push themselves. Would you agree with this statement? That leaders need to push themselves to learn these technologies that their sales force is clamoring to use. Oh, there's no doubt. You can't expect to do social selling or tell people to go do research and then, and it's amazing and it does happen, but you know, I go and I look and I say, hey, I'm going to go look and see if this particular rep or manager, manager has a LinkedIn profile. And it's, either not, it doesn't exist, or it's not updated and being utilized in the way, and that's one example of that it should be. Are you on Twitter, as an example? Are you tweeting? And and if you don't really have anything to say, are you retweeting what others are saying that you find interesting or that's relevant? So there's different ways to look at that, but yes, you're absolutely, you can't say go do something and have expectations, and yet you're not doing it yourself. And if you don't do it yourself, you never really understand the full power of what it is you're asking them to do, and especially when it comes to the social component of this. 
And millennials, by the way, they grew up with this. So they're used to this. So we should leverage that. And they want to. They want to utilize that kind of technology and, and social reach. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was just training with a bunch of uh, sales leaders recently. And one of the questions I asked the sales leaders, and for those that are listening in, listen to this question and answer this in your head. How many of you, before your first interview, look up the person that you're interviewing with through LinkedIn? And of course, what do you think the answer was, Kim? How many people do you think raised their hand out of the, in the whole room? Goodness, I hope it's like 90%. <laughs> yeah, okay, 100%. It was 100%. <laughs> yeah, you're right. right? You, you, you hope that they actually did that, right? But it was 100% yes. really raised their hand. And I said, wow, so what are you looking That's- for? And some of the leaders actually said, well, I actually Google them. Right? I go to their Facebook. I want to see what type of person they are. I want to see how they interact. I want to see what they're saying. I want to see if they have crazy stuff on there because I want to know the type of person. And I said, okay, fantastic. And what are you looking for on LinkedIn? I want to see if they know how to leverage LinkedIn. I want to see if they're actually engaging. I want to actually see if they've got a profile that is well-written, you know, their style, their personality. I want to understand those things. I want to see if they have recommendations. That's fantastic. Then my next question was, is what makes you think they're not looking you up? And it was interesting because it was like, whoa, right. And so I said, so if they come to your profile and they see that you're not sharing any type of thought leadership, that you don't have any type of an opinion, that you actually don't have any recommendations, that people love working for you and what type of leader you are and the, and the type of leader that you will lead them to the next level and that you care about them and, you have, and you're empathetic and you work with integrity. If you don't have any of those things and you're not engaging whatsoever, then what type of leader would they want to work with that doesn't do those types of things? Yes, like, that's exactly right. And so I think for me, it's like the wake up call to leaders is, you know, forget this whole concept of researching using social and and or digital channels, throw that out the door. If you want to hire and attract top talent, then you better darn well demonstrate that you are a top talent, talented leader that they want to work for and that others want to follow. And I think that's one of the elements that people miss inside of leadership that you should have a voice. For example, when a new person comes to the company, Are you posting a video online of their first day and welcoming them, uh, you know, having a receiving line, doing something that culturally stands out for that company, that organization, that office? And if you're not, well, what type of company are you working with? People don't understand that. And that's important to be able to articulate that. But any case, I totally digress because you obviously see I'm pretty passionate about that issue. (laughs) No, but it's so important. And you're absolutely right. By the way, and we all know this, and I'm sure parents are you know, talking to millennials out there as well, but you're, there's no doubt that everybody, and it's not a hundred percent. So when you said a hundred percent, you must've been in the rock star class because I know there's still people that you're thinking and you ask the questions, you know, did you go do the research or did you look them up? And, and most people do, but I still find even when I'm interviewing people that someone didn't do the due diligence to go, you know, if it's a panel, yeah, I've asked the question, you know, did you go look up the panel members? I just want to see if they're proactive and what they're doing. So it's a gauge for me to, and it's a red flag if someone says, no, I didn't. That tells me you're not going to do, even though you might say you are, you clearly didn't take the effort to do it even for a panel type of interview. And so, you know, it's one is, you know, you could have one, but if you've got four people on a panel, you know who it is, you should do that research. So there's a lot of different takes on this one, but you're, you're absolutely spot on in that, you know, not only is it management, it's everyone should be doing that and doing, and it's a great way to, as a, as a leader, to also be a thought leader, if you will, and then have people see what you're all about, you know, personally and professionally to the degree that you, you know, extend on the personal side. And oh, by the way, there's a small thing that, well, when you publish it, it can be indexed by Google, Yahoo, and Bing. And guess what? It becomes part of your personal brand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's and exactly right. You for time indefinite, but that's, that's a whole nother topic. Kim, you have been absolutely fabulous uh, here on the show. We've talked everything from, you know, the gender gap and getting sponsors to differentiating yourself from other service providers to sales culture and changing and the world of buying and selling. We covered a lot of topics and I'm grateful that you, you joined us. And there's a reason why you made it into the top 100 2018 global sales leaders by Modern Magazine. But I do have two last questions for you. Number one, if someone wants to connect with you, should they reach out to you on LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? What should they do to be able to connect with you? Any uh, medium that they feel that's appropriate. So yes, there is, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Absolutely. And what's your handle for Twitter? At Kim Green Kerr. 
at Kim Green Kerr. You heard it there. And Kim, my last question for you, my friend, is your all-time favorite movie. What is it? Oh, my all-time favorite movie? Uh, it would have to be Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. Frankly, my dear, I don't <laughs> give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Classic line, classic movie. Drama has all of it. You know, I just think it's great. I've um, loved it since I was a young, young child. Gone with the wind. There you have it. I think that's the first time we've right. had that on the show here. So with selling with social. So Kim, it's been go. fantastic having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I really appreciate it. Keep rocking it with what you're doing. And I look forward to uh, seeing you now hit the next level there at Sprint, which is I'm rooting for you. I'm going for CEO next. <laughs> you're funny. But tell you, Marcelo Mark. to step Always aside, baby. Sprint. Step aside, Marcelo. <laughs> You're great. Thanks, Mario. Love the passion. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. So.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes, along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social.